There is a story of a, uh, a young man, kind of proud young man, honestly, kind of arrogant, came to his uh, pastor who happened to be a bodybuilder, big old buff, buff guy. And uh, he started asking him, he said, he wanted to know how can I draw closer to God? Uh, he walked up to that muscular preacher and said, I've come to you because I desire to draw closer to God, Pastor. And just beaming. Uh, he led the young man out of the church, through the streets, without a word, to the sea, and chest deep out into the water. Then the, the pastor, the bodybuilding pastor, looked at me and said, Now, son, tell me again what you want. He said, A closer walk with God with a big smile upon his face. And the pastor took his strong hands on that man's shoulders and he pushed him under. Held him down there. 30 seconds later, he let him up. Now, excuse me, but what did you say that you want? He asked again. A closer <laughs> walk with God. And the heavyweight pastor, he looked at him once again and pushed him down. 30 seconds. 35 40 seconds. Finally, he let the man back up. <laughs> the man was gasping this time. And what did you say you wanted again, young man? Well, between heavy and heaving breaths, the young man looked up and he said, A closer walk. Whew. The pastor jammed him under again. 40 seconds passed. 50 seconds passed. He pulled the young man back up. He said, Son, what do you want? Air! He screamed. I need air! Air! And the pastor looked at him and said, Now, son, when you desire God, as you've just desired that air, you're going to have a closer walk with God. Y'all want a closer walk with God this morning? My papa, he used to say this. He said, you're old enough where your wants won't hurt you. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? I, I guess you, some of us have. Um, I never understood his point as a kid. I guess a kid couldn't possibly understand his point. Um, his point, as I understood years later, was that when we are children, our wants can't hurt us because we don't have the means to get all the desires that we want. We can't get everything that we want. But as we age... The opportunity to get our wants is more available to us and we find out sometimes our wants can hurt us. The things that we desire, the things that, that we thought we wanted really aren't that great to have. I guess my point is, is, what do you really want? What do you really want? Well, Jesus made it clear that your wants need to line up with His. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? What's most important to you? What's the desire of your heart? What gets you excited in the morning? Thrills you? Draws you in closer and closer? Now James here, in the book of James, he knew that if someone really understood uh, the, the desire of their heart, well, it's going to point right to what their treasure truly is and what, what, what they really think is the greatest thing that they could possibly gain. And James, as you know, was also the head of the church in Jerusalem. And because of persecution, most of his congregation had been scattered throughout the area. And he was writing this book, bearing his name in the Bible, to address his former congregants on how to live the Christian life now that he wasn't going to be their pastor. So this might be, you might say, is his love letter to them as they're going away, they're going out in the world. He wants them to understand some very important things about living like a Christian. And today his letter turns toward confronting his hearers with the reality of what's fueling your lives. Your treasure is what is fueling your life. That's what's providing the fuel for your life. And you know, uh, uh, if you go out and you get gas and it's got some water in it, what's going to happen? 
That old car ain't quite going to crank right, is it? It ain't going to quite go where it needs to go if it's not uh, fully powered. Your treasure, your gas, your fuel needs to be something that can get you through the end of the journey, right? And he's going to point them here to that. Is, a, is it a passionate desire to walk with Jesus? Is that your treasure? Is that, is that your desire? Or is it sinful desires that just cause fighting and foolishness? Which one is that? Which one could it be? Well, let's see what James tells us here this morning. Where do wars... And fights come from among you. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? I'm going to let you all in on something you probably don't, may not know. Did you know sometimes Christians fight? <laughs> Did y'all know that? You know what I'm saying? I had a bit of a tongue in cheek there. Of course they do. We've all seen that happen over time. People fighting within the church, people fussing over this and that. And it's usually, just like James says here, it's over nonsense, desires for pleasure, for your members and different things. What causes it? He wants us to guess. He asks us the question. But we all know where it comes from because it has been in us before as well. It arises from strong desires within us, struggling to be satisfied. Struggling, wanting to be satisfied. There's the lust to accumulate material things. We need, we need more and more. And, and, you know, it seems like there's never enough. There's always something else that we, we don't have that we want more of, right? If that desire is the desire fueling your life, where's that going to end up at? <laughs> it's going to end up in the trash can one day, right? Because if all your desire is to accumulate more things, the more things you accumulate, the more things you're going to want. There's the drive for people to notice us and think well of us, right? That's a desire that we have sometimes. Oh, I want everybody to pat me on the back and say I did a good job. I want everybody to, to look at me and think, wow, he's doing great things. Look what he's doing. Man, he's somebody. Uh, he wants to be somebody to emulate, right? We want that. That's a desire that we have. But if that's what's fueling our lives, what's going to happen? That first person that comes up and tells us, you didn't do so good. Oh, it destroys everything about us, right? We shut down and we don't want to have anything else to do with it. Wars and fightings rise among us, right? If that's the fuel fueling your life, what's going to happen? You're going downhill. There is the craving for pleasure, for the gratification of our bodily appetites, right? Right? Yeah, we all have bodily appetites. I know some of y'all, I hate to mention this was in a sermon right before lunch, but you're thinking about eating in a little while, right? You are. That's a bodily appetite that you have. But if you are always trying to use that as the fuel for your life, is fulfilling that bodily appetite, whether it be food or, or sex or drink or whatever little thing that you desire within you, what's going to happen? You're going to destroy yourself if that's where your treasure is, if that's what your fuel is, Right? If your fuel is all about just satisfying those desires within you, well, it's going to cause bad things to happen because we are never satisfied with those things, are we? And yet it seems we are constantly frustrated in our desire to get what we want because of that, right? Because we got the wrong fuel in the tank. Those unfulfilled longings become so powerful that we trample on those who seem to keep us from those desires. We will destroy them if they keep us from those things that we so desperately desire, which we discover can't be filled anyway. And it comes this constant cycle of destruction. A constant cycle. Because it's ground in the wrong desires. The point of our lives is being based in the wrong desires, is our problem. C.S. Lewis, he gave the following insight. This is what he said, great old Christian of the past. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Right? We are. We are. We are. We ask amiss. We ask for things that, that aren't supposed to even be our treasure. Right? But if you get the treasure, all of these things shall be added unto you. Right? 
All of these things shall be added to you, but we focus on these things. These things. As James is going to tell us here in the next few verses, we're looking to fulfill our desire with things that were never actually meant to fulfill them. And that's why we're so miserable. That's why we're fighting and infighting and going into all these different things because we have a desire for something. But it's not the right desire. Not the right desire. What does he tell us here? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, you, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, it's perfectly natural to want more for your family, to take care of them. That's good. It's a good desire, isn't it? Yeah. Y'all agree with me or not? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good desire. It's a good thing to want to take a bigger role within the church or within your organization where you're at to have ambition to move forward and, and take on more responsibility. That's a good desire, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good desire. It's a good thing to fulfill your longings uh, for romance within your marriage, right? Is that not a good thing? Does God not say that's a, a good and a right thing to take place? The problem, though, with these good desires was explained long ago by another old ancient Christian named Augustine. A preacher in the early church, he said this, Sin comes when we take a perfectly natural desire or longing or ambition and try desperately to fulfill it without God. You hear me? Without God. Not only is it sin, it is a perverse distortion of the image of the Creator in us. All these, good, um, all these good things and all our security are rightly found only and completely in Him. And that's Him with a capital H, God. Right? All our desires are found complete within Him, yet all of our desires are going away from Him, and we want Him to bless that. And you think He's going to answer that? You think He's going to answer that? No. He's not going to answer that. Without God, a desire to take care of your family becomes greed. Right? Without God. Without God, a desire to serve in the church or some other organization becomes envy. It becomes covetousness. It becomes pushing my way forward and all these different things. Without God, a desire for romance becomes adultery. It becomes fornication. It becomes all manner of wickedness. Right? Without God. See, these desires within us they're not bad. They're good desires. But we must wait for them to be given to us by God and not by using our own shoving and pushing and warring to obtain them. We've got to honor God and say there's a time when this is taking place and there's a time when it shouldn't and there's a time when something should never take place. We must understand that anything we have is given to us by God and anything we desire is not desirable if it didn't come from God. Right? Right? If God does want that in my life, I don't need that in my life. Amen. Right? Do we really want what God wants or do we want what we want? What we want. That's a very important distinction for each and every one of us to think about here this morning. Do we want... Even though we put an image of it, we put God all over it and all these different things. Do we want what God wants or do we want what we want? Think about that. With every decision about everything that you want to step out and do, do you want what God wants or do you just want what you want? It's kind of like that muscular preacher. Want that boy to understand, wasn't it? We're prone to fool ourselves and say we want God, but it's really some other desire we want filled. He was a proud boy. He wanted everybody to think, how well of me, I'm coming up and I'm talking to the preacher, I'm saying I want more of God. But he didn't really want more of God, did he? He just wanted the pat on the back for saying that he wanted more of God. Friends, I wouldn't want to leave somebody in that state, would you? I'd want them to see the truth. A school teacher is told, lost her savings, life savings in a business scheme. There was this uh, wise old crook. He was pretty slick. and 
He told her, said, honey, I'll give you the moon, you know. Just put your money in this, this account and we'll, we'll make so much money and, and, and this investment, you know. And she put all of her life savings in it. Everything she had. And then she found out at the end of it, all the money was gone. He'd run off. Her dream was shattered. She went to the Better Business Bureau to talk to them. They looked at her and they said, honey, why in the world didn't you come to us first? Don't you know we've got a list of, of good and bad businesses that you can look at and you can figure out and know uh, what, what's, what, which uh, one you can put your investments in and which ones you can't? And the lady, she kind of sadly said, well, yeah, yeah, I heard about you. I knew who you were. I knew what you did. I've always known about you, really. But I didn't come because I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it if I asked. How many of us are like that? We don't want to come to God and say, God, do you want me to do that? Because we're afraid what he's going to say, right? We're afraid he's going to tell us no. Or, or maybe in some cases, we're afraid he's going to tell us yes. I go, Lord, I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. Most of us know, I think, when our desires have went south, when they're leading us in the wrong way, they're leading us in the wrong direction, but we don't want to hear it because the desire is so strong to go after it, right? Right? Amen or oh me, I know I've been there, okay? Maybe the rest of you ain't, but I've been there, right? We go after it anyway. And we find it was not what we needed. It was not the fuel we needed for our lives whatsoever. It was destructive to our lives in reality. And we knew it, but we didn't hear it. Resist the desire that takes you out of God's will for your life. It'll destroy your life to get things that God doesn't want you to have. Like the couple who asked God to bless their relationship while they were living together outside of marriage. You think God will bless that? You think God will bless sin when you're doing that? He told you what was the blessing or the way to go, right? God's not going to bless that. Or the businessman who asked God to bless his company while he was laundering uh, money for criminals. Is God going to bless that? God ain't going to bless that, is he? Oh, he might become more financially uh, adept here, but there's no blessings that are going to last from eternity from none of that, is there? Right? Everything's very simple and clear when you, you think about it, about God. These are just true things. These are things that we don't want to hear because our desires are so strong that we want those things, right? We don't want to hear them. Let's go to God in prayer, James says, and not ask amiss. Don't ask in the wrong way for the wrong thing. Let's align our desires with what God uh, knows is best in His will. Let's ask according to His will. And He says, we'll receive. We'll receive. James is really clear. Look here. It says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity? With God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? I imagine God sometimes feels like that muscular pastor that I mentioned at the beginning of this message. Warning us to, 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 to see, to, to put us to the test to see if we really want him like we says we do. I can hear him saying, you keep saying you want God. You keep saying that you want God. Yet you don't show up. You don't show up at church when it's time to worship Him. You don't show up. Do you really want God if you don't show up when it's time to worship Him? Do you really want God if you don't show up to witness when you have the opportunity to your neighbors, when that opportunity arises and you know the Lord's pressing you and telling you to speak in that person's life, yet you don't open your mouth. Do you really want God? Do you really want God when you, you don't show up each morning with your Bible? Nobody else around to see you, but you're there in your Bible studying over it to read it at least once a day, maybe more than that. Do these Bibles get cracked open after Sunday morning or Wednesday night? Do they? Do they? Do we really want God when we don't prepare with diligence the work that God has given us to do? Just at the last minute, we throw something together and send it out? Do we really want God when that's the case? 
Do we really want God when our money is only spent upon ourselves, and we never really have ever given anything substantially to the church, let alone a tithe of what God has given us? Do we really want God? Is that the treasure of our heart, the apple of our eye, the most important thing within our life? If He's not really in our life, except for an hour on a Sunday morning? Do we want God? Do we really want God? You say, well, we pray though when we're in trouble. But do we pray when we're not? Do we really want God? Does that sound like God's friends or God's enemies? That's what James is, is saying here. He talks about adulterers and adulteresses. He's talking about men and women who are married to God, right? And yet they're out in the world with everything else, right? They're after everything else in the world besides God. And he calls the name as he sees it. See, these are the characters or rather the characteristics of a world that is in enmity with God, enemies with God. Do you think the world shows up at church? No. Do you think the world cares about witnessing to others? No. Do you think the world cares about reading the Bible? No. Do you think the world actually cares about doing any work for God? No. Do you think the world gives money to God? I did see one atheist give money to God one time, but that's not a natural occurrence. Do you think the world cares about praying to God when they're not in trouble? No. No. None of those things are the case, are they? Are we more concerned with being friends with the world or with God? Are our desires worldly or are they otherworldly? Friends, if God is living inside of you, and He is if you've been saved. He is. He's inside you. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit is living inside of you. He gets jealous of your negligence. He gets jealous of it. He says, well, we can have such a wonderful relationship together, you know, but you don't want to come in and take part. You don't want to be part of that relationship. You, you know, you're out here with everything else in the world instead of with me. It's like the spouse who just doesn't understand why the other spouse doesn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. He mourns inside of you for your lack of desire. Ephesians 4.30 tells us this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit sealed inside of you till the day you're redeemed when you step out of this, this life in, into your resurrected body. But He's sealed inside of you, it says. Don't grieve Him. Don't cause Him pain and hurt and mourning and jealousy. He's jealous. He grieves over your lack of desire to grow. It doesn't have to be that way, though. It don't have to be that way. He wants relationship even after salvation took part, okay? Amen. James reminds us the most important aspect of living and receiving the Christian life right here in verse 6. This verse has become so precious to me, especially the last part of it. It's repeated over and over throughout the Bible. But He gives more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, He says... God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Today, my friends, I want to tell you about something special. Today's my birthday. You say, Scott's not your birthday. Some of y'all have any minds. My mama's sitting over there. She knows, I know it's not your birthday, son. I was there when you were born. Right? No, it's not my physical birthday, but today's my spiritual birthday. Amen. It is. Today, on September 29th, 1982, I was saved in a little revival. It was a Wednesday night then instead of a Sunday. I was saved. I come forward. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I was made new. I think I've said it here a few Sundays ago. I just felt relieved and clean all over after that occurred. But that wasn't the end of my relationship with Jesus. 
And I've given him a lot of points to grieve over over the years. I promise you that. I have. But I don't want to grieve him anymore. Do you remember how it came to be when you were saved so long ago? Do y'all remember that? What happened that day, that night, whatever time it was? You know, a lot of times we look at the ABCs when we think about it in Bible school. We admitted, didn't we? We admitted then we'd come to terms with it, right? You were a sinner and you liked sinning. But you found that sin didn't give you all your desires, right? You found out you was on the wrong fuel, right? That's what it was. You found out you were on the wrong fuel. You found out that sin didn't get you anywhere. And so you admitted, you admitted that you needed God. Now, now, at this point in time, why do we forget after a long time with walking with Jesus, we want to put the wrong fuel in the tank? Why is that? As if those sinful ways and desires somehow are okay now that I've been forgiven. I can keep on running on them with my tank. No, you can't. No, you can't. They're not going to fuel you, are they? They're not the fuel you need. Next came B, believe. Back then, you, you believed that Jesus was and, and He is God who died for the sins of the world. And most importantly, you remembered He died for me. He died for, you got emotional about it, maybe. You got excited about it. You were passionate about it. Why? Because you knew you were a sinner. You had done wrong. You knew there was no hope for you whatsoever. And all of a sudden you realized there was this one who came and died for my sins and made me new. He had done this not just for the whole world, but for me. For me. And it filled your heart with joy and excitement. And then you confessed it, didn't you? See, you confessed it. You confessed for all the world to hear. You weren't ashamed of it, not one little bit. You'd do anything for Jesus. Anything for what He had done. You confessed that Jesus was your Savior. He was your Lord. And, and you didn't care who knew about it, right? Didn't care what, what might hinder you from going. You were all on for Jesus if you really got saved. I, I truly believe that. But now, where do we find ourselves? Often trying to live like the world while claiming we've confessed that we're not of the world. Let me tell you what, you ain't going to get that stuff to run in your tank. All right? You ain't going to get that stuff to run in your tank. You're a new creature, you're a new type of vehicle, and you can't put that type of gas in this new vehicle, all right? You've been made new. You can't run off those old sins no more. So it comes down to this. What do you desire? What do you desire? Where is your heart? Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that runs vice versa as well. Is God your treasure here today? Today's the day to figure that out. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.